Crisis of Conscience Chapter 3 Governing Body Page 44 Not that we are the masters over your faith, but we are fellow workers for your joy, for it is by your faith that you are standing. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 24 The above quoted statement of Paul repeatedly came into my mind during the nine years of my participation in the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses. I could wish that all witnesses might have the experience of participation. Perhaps then they could understand what words alone cannot convey. To clarify what the governing body is, Jehovah's Witnesses understand that Christ Jesus, as head of the congregation, feeds and governs his congregation by means of a faithful and discreet slave class. This class is now said to be composed of a remnant of the 144,000 persons anointed as heirs of Christ's heavenly kingdom. The footnote reads, the term faithful and discreet slave is drawn from Jesus' parable at Matthew chapter 24, verse 45 to 47, the number 144,000 is taken from Revelation chapter 7, verse 4 and chapter 14, verse 1, 3. End of footnote. But from among such class there is a small number of men who act as a governing body and perform all administrative functions for the global congregation, not only for the present number of about 8,500 anointed ones out of whom these men are drawn, but also for the approximately 6.1 million other persons associated who are not considered to be among the heavenly heirs. The footnote reads, see the January 1st, 2004 Watchtower, page 21. End of footnote. It seemed an awesome responsibility for me when I became one of 11 members of the worldwide governing body in 1971, the number later grew to as many as 18 in 1977 and as of the year 2000 now stands at 13. The footnote reads, at that time the 11 members were, Nathan Knorr, Fred France, Grant Souter, Thomas Sullivan, Milton Henschel, Lyman Swingle, John Groh, these seven also being the directors of the Watchtower Society, then, William Jackson, Leo Greenlees, George Gungas, Raymond France. Of these eleven men, I am the only person surviving. End of footnote. The first sessions of the weekly meetings, held every Wednesday, that I attended, however, proved quite different from what I had expected. A rotational chairmanship had recently been put into effect and Vice President Fred France was that year's chairman. But the matters to be discussed were determined by the corporation president, Nathan. Nor whatever he considered advisable for the body to discuss he brought to the meeting and generally that was the first time we had any knowledge of the matter under discussion. During some weeks the meetings consisted simply of a consideration of lists of recommendations for traveling representatives in different countries. The name, age, date of baptism, whether of the anointed or not, the years of full-time service being read out. In the vast majority of cases these were no more than names to us. We seldom knew any of the individuals involved. So after listening to such readings of lists from Suriname or Zambia or Sri Lanka. We would vote on the appointment of these men. The footnote reads, some witnesses doubtless had the idea that appointment of congregational elders is done by the governing body itself. Initially, a couple of governing body members did sit with a staff member of the service department and review and pass on all appointments of elders in the United States. This practice was discontinued after a relatively short time. However, and appointments were thereafter left up to the service department staff. Members In other countries appointments of elders were from the start handled entirely by the Watchtower's branch offices. The only appointments made since by the governing body, in the US or elsewhere, were those of traveling representatives and of branch committee members. I believe this was in order that these men might present themselves as representatives of the governing body in a special sense, one that carries greater weight and implies greater authority than that of the local elders. End of footnote. 
I recall that Thomas Sullivan, usually called Bud, was then in his 80s, nearly blind and in poor health. He repeatedly would give in to sleep during these sessions and it seemed a shame to wake him to vote on things he knew little about. At times the entire meeting lasted but a few minutes, one that I recall lasted only seven minutes, including the opening prayer. Then from time to time President Nor would bring some problem correspondence involving questions as to certain conduct by individual witnesses, and the body was to decide what policy should be adopted regarding these, whether the particular conduct called for disfellowshipping, some lesser discipline, or no action at all. During that period, and on up until 1975, all decisions were expected to be unanimous. After discussion, a motion would be made, seconded, and then the chairman called for a show of hands. If a unanimous vote was not obtained, as occasionally different ones would not vote for a motion, generally, some compromise solution was developed that could gain unanimity. As is but natural in those circumstances, there was a certain sense of pressure to go along with the majority rather than take a loan stance on matters and thus appear as independent or out of harmony. There were votes where I did not raise my hand, but as a rule I conformed. In the few instances where my not having voted resulted in someone's proposing a compromise motion, even though the compromise motion still did not seem fully right to me I would concede and vote with the majority. It appeared necessary to conform if matters were to be decided and expedited rather than stalemated. However, issues began arising that made this more and more difficult for me. As weeks went along discussions were held on such subjects as whether a father qualifies as an elder if he allows a son or daughter to marry when only 18 years of age, whether one qualifies as an elder if he approves of his son or daughter taking higher education. The footnote reads, higher education was, and to some extent still is, generally frowned upon as conducive to loss of faith and as providing an atmosphere likely to contribute to immorality. End of footnote. Whether one qualifies as an elder if he does shift work and sometimes, while on night shift, misses congregational meetings, whether elders can accept circumstantial evidence of adultery, or the testimony of a wife that her husband confessed adultery to her, and whether this is sufficient to allow for scriptural divorce and remarriage, whether a divorce is scripturally acceptable if, even where adultery has been committed, the one obtaining the divorce is the guilty mate rather than the innocent mate. The footnote reads, at that time the ruling was that only if the innocent mate got the divorce was it scripturally valid. End of footnote what validity a divorce has when obtained on grounds other than adultery if, after the divorce is granted, evidence of pre-divorce adultery comes to light, what the situation is if such a divorce is obtained and there is post-divorce adultery, whether an innocent mate's having sex relations with an adulterous mate, subsequent to learning of the adultery, cancels out the right to divorce that mate and be free to remarry, whether it is proper for a witness to pay a fine if that fine is imposed because of an infraction of law resulting from his witnessing activity or because of some stand he had taken in order to adhere to witness beliefs. The footnote reads, the policy had been that the fine should not be paid, that in these circumstances it would be an admission of guilt and hence a compromise of one's integrity. This policy has changed. End of footnote. Whether it is proper to send food or other assistance to persons by means of the Red Cross, the main issue here being that the cross is a religious symbol and so the Red Cross organization might be quasi-religious, this discussion was quite lengthy and was carried over to a subsequent meeting, issues about the society's then existing practice of using irregular channels to funnel money into certain countries, Indonesia as one example, in a way that would gain greater value for the American dollars involved, doing this even though the particular country had laws ruling this illegal, also as to getting certain equipment into some countries without having to pay the heavy import tax imposed by law, 
whether witnesses belonging to labor unions can accept strike duty assignments or can accept a union order to do cleaning work on the union premises in lieu of accepting such assignments. As picketing, whether witnesses could respond to military conscription simply to do work in cotton fields, this from Bolivia. These are only a partial sampling of things discussed during the first two years or so of my being on the body. The effect of our decisions was considerable in its impact on the lives of others. In matters of divorce, for example, the congregation elders serve as a sort of religious court and if they are not satisfied as to the validity of a divorce action, the individual who goes through with such a divorce and then later remarries becomes subject to disfellowshipping. A matter, not among those just mentioned, but which brought considerable discussion involved a witness couple in California. Someone had seen in their bedroom certain literature and photographs dealing with unusual sex practices. I do not recall that we learned just how or why the witness individual reporting this happened to have access to the couple's bedroom. Investigation and interrogation by the local elders confirmed that the couple did engage in sexual relations other than simple genital copulation. The footnote reads, an article in the December 15, 1969, Watchtower, pages 765, 766, had first focused attention on such sexual relations, discussing them at considerable length, and this doubtless served to sensitize the elders to reports of such conduct, in fact, was likely responsible for this report about people's private bedroom matters being made in the first place. End of footnote. Correspondence from the elders came into Brooklyn and the governing body was called upon to rule as to what action if any should be taken toward the couple. Until the correspondence was read to us that morning, none of us aside from the president had had any opportunity to think about the subject. Yet within a couple of hours the decision was reached that the couple was subject to disfellowshipping. This was thereafter set out as a formal published policy, applicable to any persons engaging willfully in similar practices. The footnote reads, see the Watchtower, December 1, 1972, pages 734 to 736, also November 15, 1974, pages 703, 704. End of footnote. The published material was understood and applied in such a way that marriage mates generally felt obliged to report to the elders if any such practice existed or developed in their marriage, whether mutually agreed upon or done solely at the initiation of one of the mates. In the latter case the non-initiating mate was expected to come forward and convey this information to the elders if the initiating mate was unwilling to do so. To fail to come forward generally is viewed as indicative of an unrepentant attitude and as weighing in favor of disfellowshipping. The belief that disfellowshipping cuts one off from the one organization where salvation can be found, as well as from friends and relatives, exercises heavy pressure on the person to conform, no matter how difficult confession, or reporting, to the elders may be. The governing body's decision in 1972 resulted in a sizable number of judicial hearings as elders followed up on reports or confessions of the sexual practices involved. Women experienced painful embarrassment in such hearings as they responded to the elders' questions about the intimacies of their marital relations. Many marriages where one of the mates was not a witness underwent a turbulent period, with the non-witness mate objecting strenuously to what he or she considered an unwarranted invasion of bedroom privacy. Some marriages broke up with resulting divorce. The footnote reads, in a memorandum to the governing body, dated August 9, 1976, a headquarters staff member handling correspondence states, many, many problems have resulted from the position taken often where there is an unbelieving meaning a non-witness husband. Wives have refused to allow such husbands to stimulate them in this way or to stimulate the husbands in this way. As a result marriages have broken up. End of footnote. An unprecedented volume of mail came in over a period of five years, most of it questioning the scriptural basis for the governing body members inserting themselves into the private lives of others in such a way, and expressing inability to see the validity of the 
Arguments advanced in print to support the stand taken. The principle portion of scripture relied upon was Romans, chapter 1, verses 24 to 27, dealing with homosexuality, and those writing to the society. Pointed out that they could not see how it could rightly be applied to heterosexual relations between man and wife. Other letters, often from wives, simply expressed confusion and anguish over their uncertainty as to the properness of their sexual foreplay. One woman said she had talked to an elder and he had told her to write to the governing body for a sure answer. So she wrote, saying that she and her husband loved each other deeply and then she described the certain type of foreplay they were accustomed to, stating I believe it's a matter of conscience, but I am writing you to be sure. Her closing words were, I am scared, I am hurt, and I am more worried at this time about my husband's feeling for the truth. I know you will tell me what to do. In another typical letter an elder wrote, saying that he had a problem he wanted to get straightened out in his mind and heart and that to do this he felt it's best to contact the mother for advice. The footnote reads, Many witnesses refer to the organization as our mother, and this is because the Watchtower magazine has used this term in such way, as in the February 1, 1952, issue, page 80, and the May 1, 1957, issue, pages 274, 284, see also the April 1, 1994 Watchtower, page 32. End of footnote. The problem dealt with his marital sex life and he said that he and his wife were confused as to where to draw the line in the act of foreplay before the actual act of sex. He assured the society that he and his wife would follow any advice you give us to the letter. These letters illustrate the implicit trust these persons had come to place in the governing body, the belief that the men forming that body could tell them where to draw the line in even such intimate aspects of their personal lives, and that they should rightly hew to that line to the letter. Many letters went out from the society in response. Often they endeavored to provide some limited clarification, saying without exactly saying, as to what sexual foreplay fell within the bounds of condemned actions, other foreplay thereby being exempt. A memo from a member of the society's service department, in June of 1976, discusses a telephone conversation with an instructor of seminars, held with elders. The memo relates that the instructor had phoned about an elder attending the seminar who confessed to certain disapproved sexual practices within his marriage. The memo states, brother here giving the name of the instructor closely discussed the matter with him to determine whether it was really oral copulation that was involved. The instructor had told him in view of the circumstances that he ought to go to the other members of the committee and it happened that the other two members of the committee were in the class and so he went and talked with them. Now the instructor was wondering what else should be done. It was suggested to him that he write a full report on this to the society so that in the future when he has any such case come up he will have direction on how to handle the matter and he will not have to call. This illustrates the extent to which interrogation went in intimacy and the extent to which the headquarters organization supervised the whole situation. Letter after letter revealed that the persons involved felt positively responsible before God to report to the elders any deviance from the norm established by the governing body. A man in a Midwestern state who confessed to an infringement of the governing body's decision as regards his marital relations with his wife was told by the elders that they were writing about this to the society, he also wrote an accompanying letter. Eight weeks passed and finally he wrote again to Brooklyn, saying that the waiting, anxiety and anticipation is almost more than I can bear. He said that he had been removed from all congregational assignments, including offering prayer at the meetings, and that almost weekly I am losing something that I have worked and prayed for for 30 years. He pleaded for an early answer, saying I do need some mental relief as to how I stand with Jehovah's organization. Some elders endeavored to take a moderate approach to the matter. Doing so, however, could make them liable for reprimand from the headquarters offices in Brooklyn. Consider the letter on the following page. 
The letter is a photocopy of that sent by the society's service department to one body of elders, names and specific places have been blocked out. The footnote reads, this copy is of the carbon copy of the letter and hence bears no stamped watch tower signature. The symbol SCE identifies the writer of the letter as Merton Campbell of the Brooklyn Service Department. End of footnote. Interestingly, some elders actually felt that the governing body's position was, if anything, somewhat lenient or limited. A letter sent by an elder in the United States says, some of the older brothers felt that the governing body could have gone even further in condemning unnatural practices among married couples to include assuming certain positions when performing the sexual act. Later this elder expressed his own feelings saying, since Jehovah went into great detail in this chapter 18 of Leviticus as well as other chapters on sexual behavior, why is there no statement made to married couples as to acceptable or unacceptable forms of copulation? Would it not be likely that Jehovah would have done so if he wanted this personal and private area of the marriage union open to the scrutiny or opinions of the judges or older men of Israel so that appropriate action could be taken against offending individuals? August 4, 1976 Body of Elders of the W Congregation of Jehovah's Witnesses Dear Brothers we have a copy of the letter dated July 21st from the Committee of the S. Congregation in California in which they write about matters involving J. Please let us know if any of the elders in the congregation have been giving incorrect advice with regard to matters involving oral sex. If any of the elders in the congregation have advised married persons that it would not be improper for them to engage in oral sex, then on what basis was such counsel given? If wrong counsel was given, then let us know if appropriate stops have been taken to correct any misunderstanding on the part of individuals who were given wrong counsel and let us how if the elders concerned now are in agreement with what has been stated in the society's publications with regard to oral sex. If any of you brothers as elders have been advising individuals that oral sex would be permissible as foreplay prior to having actual sex relations, then such advice was not correct. Thank you for your attention to the above matter. May Jehovah's rich blessing go with you as you endeavor always to care for your responsibilities as elders in an exemplary manner. Your brothers. C.C., Judicial Committee of the S. Congregation of Jehovah's Witnesses, C.A. Some of those affected by the organization's ruling were persons whose normal sexual functions had been seriously impaired by an operation or by an accident. Some of these expressed dismay at the position in which the governing body's decision placed them. One such person who had become impotent in this way, had, during the years that followed, been able to perform a sexual role through one of the means now condemned by the organization. Before the governing body's ruling he said he had been able to stop feeling like half a man, because he could still please his wife. Now, he wrote saying that he could not see the scriptural proof for the stand taken in the Watchtower magazine but that his wife felt duty bound to obey, and because he loved her he acceded. He said he knew that he was the same as before, yet emotionally he was crumbling since he feared their marriage would be seriously affected. He pleaded to be told if there was not some loophole in God's will that would allow him the satisfaction of pleasing his wife. All of these situations put considerable strain on the conscience of elders called upon to deal with those offending against the governing body's decision. At the conclusion of the earlier mentioned letter from one elder, that elder states, I find I can only use what Bible laws and principles I understand with any degree of sincerity and conviction in representing Jehovah and Christ Jesus, and if I have to administer these laws and principles in exercising my responsibility as an elder in the congregation I want to do it not because I have come to take for granted that this is Jehovah's organization and I'm going to follow it no matter what it says, but do it because I truly believe it to be scripturally proven and correct. I truly want to continue believing as Paul admonished the Thessalonians in the second chapter, verse 13, to accept the word of God, not as of men, but as it truthfully is, as the word of God. His position is notable. 
I frankly doubt that many elders today would feel free to express themselves in this manner, declaring their position in such clear, frank terms. Though I find the sexual practices involved to be definitely contrary to my personal standards, I can honestly say that I did not favor the disfellowshipping decision made by the body. But that is all that I can say. For when the vote came I conformed to the majority decision. I felt dismayed when the body assigned me to prepare material in support of the decision, yet I accepted the assignment and wrote it as was desired by the body, in conformity with its decision. Thus I cannot say that I acted according to the same fine outlook expressed by the elder just quoted. My belief in the organization as God's only agency on earth caused me to do what I did at that time without particularly great qualms of conscience. The bulk of the correspondence on this subject never reached the governing body, being handled by the staff members assigned to correspondence desks or by the members of the service department. I am sure, however, that the various governing body members must have been made aware, likely through personal contacts and conversations, that many felt they had improperly invaded people's private lives. When finally, after some five years, the matter came up again on the agenda, the disfellowshipping policy was reversed and the governing body in effect now withdrew itself from that intimate area of others' lives. Again the body assigned me to prepare material for publication, this time advising of the change. I found it personally satisfying to be able to acknowledge, even though rather obliquely, that the organization had been in error. The February 15, 1978, Watchtower, pages 30 and 32, carried the material and included the following points. A careful further weighing of this matter, however, convinces us that, in view of the absence of clear scriptural instruction, these are matters for which the married couple themselves must bear the responsibility before God and that these marital intimacies do not come within the province of the congregational elders to attempt to control nor to take disfellowshipping action with such matters as the sole basis. Of course, if any person chooses to approach an elder for counsel he or she may do so and the elder can consider scriptural principles with such a one, acting as a shepherd but not attempting to, in effect, police the marital life of the one inquiring. This should not be taken as a condoning of all the various sexual practices that people engage in, for that is by no means the case. It simply expresses a keen sense of responsibility to let the scriptures rule and to refrain from taking a dogmatic stand where the evidence does not seem to provide sufficient basis. It also expresses confidence in the desire of Jehovah's people as a whole to do all things as unto him and to reflect his splendid qualities in all their affairs. It expresses a willingness to leave the judgment of such intimate marital matters in the hands of Jehovah God and his Son, who have the wisdom and knowledge of all circumstances necessary to render the right decisions. Actually, I felt that way about a whole host of matters that came before us, that there was really no basis in scripture for taking dogmatic stance on the vast majority of things we were ruling on. I expressed that view here and it was accepted by the body on this point. I expressed that same view again and again in the future but it was rarely accepted. Looking over the letters at hand, some of which have been presented, whatever satisfaction it brought to write that corrective material seems rather hollow. For I know that no matter what was said, it could never in any way compensate for or repair all the damage in embarrassment, mental confusion, emotional distress, guilt pangs, and broken marriages that resulted from the earlier decision. A decision made in a few hours by men almost all of whom were approaching the matter cold, with no previous knowledge, thought, meditation, specific prayer on the matter or searching of scriptures, but whose decision was nonetheless put in force globally for five years and affected many people for a lifetime. None of it needed ever to have occurred. The footnote reads, A few years after my resignation from the governing body, the organization in effect reinstated basic elements of its earlier policy on unnatural sex practices. The March 15, 1983 Watchtower, pages 30, 31, while stating that it was not up to elders to police the private marital matters of congregation members, 
nonetheless ruled that the advocacy or the practice of what was classed as unnatural sex relations among married persons not only would disqualify a man for eldership or other society-appointed position but could even lead to expulsion from the congregation. Lloyd Berry had not been present when the 1972 policy had been effectually cancelled by a governing body decision and upon his return he expressed his disapproval of the cancellation. Since he headed the writing department and oversaw the production of Watchtower material, his influence may have contributed toward this shifting back to much of the earlier position. Whatever the case, this 1983 material did not produce the great surge of judicial hearings that accompanied the initial announcement of that policy in 1972, perhaps because that earlier experience had produced sufficient bad fruitage to restrain the zeal for inquiry on the part of elders. End of footnote. Another issue that arose, some would link to the above, involved a witness in South America whose husband had confessed to having had sexual relations with another woman. The problem was that he said that the relations were of the kind involved in the issue earlier described, in this particular case anal and not genital copulation. The decision of the governing body was that this did not qualify as adultery, that adultery required strictly genital copulation capable of producing children. Therefore the man had not become one flesh with the other woman and hence the decision was that the wife had no grounds for scriptural divorce and future remarriage. The existing rule of voting required unanimity of decision and I conformed. I felt genuinely disturbed, however, at thinking about this woman and her being told that she could not scripturally choose to become free from a man guilty of such an act. The decision also meant that a husband who engaged in homosexual acts with other men or who even had relations with a beast was not subject to scriptural divorce, since a man could not, with any procreative possibilities, become one flesh with another man or with an animal. A Watchtower magazine earlier that year had, in fact, specifically ruled this way. The footnote reads, see the Watchtower of January 1, 1972, pages 31, 32. End of footnote. The emotional upset I felt moved me to make a study of the original language terms, in Greek, used in Matthew, chapter 19, verse 9. The Society's New World Translation there presents Jesus as saying, I say to you that whoever divorces his wife, except on the ground of fornication, and marries another commits adultery. Two different words are used, fornication and adultery, Yet the Watchtower publications for many decades had taken the position that they both referred essentially to the same thing, that the fornication meant a man's having adulterous relations with a woman other than his wife, or a wife's having such relations with a man not her husband. Why then, I asked myself, did Matthew, in recording Jesus' statement, use two different words, pornia and moikia, if the same thing, adultery, was actually meant in both cases? Searching through the many translations, Bible dictionaries, commentaries and lexicons in the Bethel Library, the reason became obvious. Practically every book I opened showed that the Greek term pornia, rendered as fornication in the New World Translation, was a very broad term and applied to all types of sexual immorality and for this reason many Bible translations simply render it as immorality, sexual immorality, unchastity, unfaithfulness. The footnote reads, in the original Greek of Matthew chapter 19, verse 9, the word rendered adultery is moikia and, unlike pornia, is not broad but very limited in meaning, being restricted to adultery in the ordinary sense of the word. End of footnote. Lexicons clearly showed that the term was also applied to homosexual relations. The conclusive point to me, however, was realizing that in the Bible itself pornia is used at Jude, verse 7, to denote the notorious homosexual conduct of people in Sodom and Gomorrah. I prepared 14 pages of material containing the results of the research and made copies for each member of the body. But I felt very uncertain as to how this would be received and so I went to Fred Francis' office and explained what I had done, expressing my doubt that the material would be favorably accepted. He said, I don't believe there will be any difficulty. Though very brief, 
the words were spoken with a tone of confidence. When I inquired if he would like to see what had been found, he declined and again said he thought there would be no problem. My impression was that he was already aware of some of the points my research had revealed, though for how long I had no way of knowing. Since he had been the principal translator of the society's New World Translation I felt he must surely have at least been apprised of the true sense of the word pornea, fornication. The footnote reads, the New World Translation bears no translator's name and is presented as the anonymous work of the New World Translation Committee. Other members of that committee were Nathan Knorr, Albert Schroeder and George Gungas. Fred France, however, was the only one with sufficient knowledge of the Bible languages to attempt translation of this kind. He had studied Greek for two years at the University of Cincinnati but was only self-taught in Hebrew. End of footnote. When the matter came up in the governing body session, the material I submitted was accepted, Fred France having expressed his support and I was assigned to prepare articles for publication in the Watchtower presenting the changed stand this would bring about. The footnote reads, see the Watchtower of December 15, 1972, pages 766 to 768. End of footnote. I still remember, some time after the articles appeared, a letter that came in from a witness who some years before had discovered her husband having sexual relations with an animal. As she said, I couldn't live with a man like that, and she divorced him. Later she remarried. The congregation then disfellowshipped her for so doing as she was not scripturally free. After the Watchtower articles appeared, she now wrote and asked that, in view of the changed position, something be done to clear her name of the reproach she had suffered as a result of the disfellowshipping action. I could only write her that the articles published were themselves a vindication of her course. Though again it had been satisfying to prepare the material acknowledging the organization's erroneous view and rectifying it, the sobering thought remained that this could never undo whatever harm the previous position had caused over decades of time and Dora only God knows. To how many people? The governing body at that time was, in reality, both a judicial court and also because its decisions and definitions had force of law for all Jehovah's Witnesses. A legislative body. It was a governing body in the sense that the Sanhedrin of Bible times might be called such, its functions being similar. Just as all major questions involving Jehovah's name people of that period were brought to the Sanhedrin in Jerusalem for settlement, so with the governing body of Jehovah's. Witnesses in Brooklyn but it was not an administrative body in any sense of the word. The administrative authority and responsibility rested exclusively with the corporation president, Nathan H. Knorr. I had not expected this because the same year of my appointment Vice President France had given a speech, later carried in the December 15, 1971, Watchtower, in which he described the role of the governing body, contrasting this with that of the corporation, the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. The Vice President's language was unusually bold and frank, as he stated again and again that the corporation was simply an agency, a temporary instrument used by the governing body, pages 754, 760. This worldwide evangelizing organization is not tailored according to any present-day legal corporation that may be required under the laws of man-made political governments that now face destruction in the war of the great day of God the Almighty at Harmageddon. Revelation 16, verse 14 to 16, no legal corporation of earth shapes the evangelizing organization or governs it. Rather, it governs such corporations as mere temporary instruments useful in the work of the great theocrat. Hence it is patterned according to his design for it. It is a theocratic organization, ruled from the divine top down, and not from the rank and file up. The dedicated, baptized members of it are under theocracy. Earthly legal corporations will cease when the man-made governments that chartered them perish shortly. 
so the society's voting members see that this governing body could most directly use that administrative agency as an instrument in behalf of the work of the faithful and discreet slave class by having members of the governing body on the board of directors of the society. They recognize that the society is not the administrative body, but is merely an agency for administering matters. Hence the society's voting members do not desire that there be any basis for conflict and division. They do not want to cause anything like a situation where the administrative agency controls and directs the user of that agency, which user is the governing body as representing the faithful and discreet slave class. No more so than to have the tail wag a dog instead of the dogs wagging its tail. A legal religious instrument according to Caesar's law should not attempt to direct and control its creator, rather, the creator of the legal religious instrument should control and direct it. Because of the simile used, the talk was spoken of by some as the tail wagging the dog talk. Unquestionably it contained powerful expressions. The problem was that they presented a picture that was completely contrary to fact. The governing body did not control the corporation, not at the time that the aforementioned talk was given by the vice president, nor at the time the material was published, nor for some four years thereafter. The picture presented eventually did come to be true, but only as the result of a very drastic adjustment, one unpleasantly fraught with heated emotions and considerable division. Strange as it may seem to most Jehovah's Witnesses today, the kind of governing body described in that talk had never existed in the whole history of the organization. It took over 90 years for it to come into being and its present existence dates only from January 1, 1976, or about one fifth of the organization's history. I will explain why I make such a statement and why it is factual. Three Monarchs You know that in the world, rulers lord it over their subjects, and their great men make them feel the weight of authority, but it shall not be so with you. Matthew chapter 20, verse 25, 26, New English Bible the history of Jehovah's Witnesses becomes one of record particularly with the publication of the first issue of the Watchtower magazine on July 1, 1879. The corporation called the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society was formed in 1881 and incorporated in 1884. It is certainly true that back there the corporation did not shape, govern, control or direct, to use the words of the Vice President, the governing body of those associated with the watchtower. It did not, and in fact could not do so, for the simple reason that no governing body existed. Charles Taz Russell personally started the watchtower as his own magazine and was its sole editor, during his lifetime all those associated with the watchtower society accepted him as their one and only pastor. It is true, of course, that the society, once formed, had a board of directors, Russell's wife, Maria, originally being one of these. But that board was not viewed as a governing body nor did it serve as such. Yet the Watchtower of December 15, 1971, pages 760 and 761, had made this statement. How the governing body came to exist. How did this governing body make its appearance in recent times? evidently under the direction of Jehovah God and his son Jesus Christ. According to the facts available, the governing body became associated with the Watchtower Bible and Track Society of Pennsylvania. C.T. Russell was patently of that governing body back there in the last quarter of the 19th century. It is difficult for me to understand how Fred France could write this as being according to the facts available inasmuch as he became affiliated with the Watchtower organization during Russell's life and knew personally what the reality then was. What do the facts available actually show? Concerning the board of directors, Russell himself states in a special edition of Zion's Watchtower dated April 25, 1894, page 59. Having, up to December 1st, 1893, 3,705 voting shares, out of a total of sick tie 3. 183 voting shares, Sister Russell and myself of course elect the officers, and thus control the society, and this was fully understood by the directors from the first. Their usefulness, it was understood, would come to the front in the event of our death. The footnote reads, 
Mrs. Russell resigned as associate editor of the Watchtower in October, 1886, due to disagreement with her husband and on November 9, 1897, she separated from her husband. She remained a director of the society, however, until February 12, 1900. In 1906 she obtained a divorce. End of footnote. That Russell clearly did not view the directors, or any others, as a governing body along with himself is obvious from the course he consistently followed. The Watchtower of March 1, 1923, page 68, says. Often when asked by others, who is that faithful and wise servant? Brother Russell would reply, some. Say I am, while others say the society is. The article then goes on to say. Both statements were true, for Brother Russell was in fact the society in a most absolute sense, in this. That he directed the policy and course of the society without regard to any other person on earth. He sometimes sought advice of others connected with the society, listened to their suggestions, and then did according to his own judgment, believing that the Lord would have him thus do. In answer to a question from some Watchtower readers, C.T. Russell wrote in 1900 and 6. No, the truths I present, as God's mouthpiece, were not revealed in visions or dreams, nor by God's audible voice, nor all at once, but gradually, especially since 1870, and particularly since 1880. Neither is this clear unfolding of truth due to any human ingenuity or acuteness of perception, but to the simple fact that God's due time has come, and if I did not speak, and no other agent could be found, the very stones would cry out. The footnote reads, The Watchtower, July 15, 1906, page 229. End of footnote. Believing himself to be God's mouthpiece and his agent for revelation of truth, it is understandable why he would see no need for a governing body. The year after this statement, Russell prepared a last will and testament which was published in the December 1, 1916 Watchtower magazine following his death in that year. Since nothing illustrates more clearly the total control Charles Russell exercised over the Watchtower magazine, the full text of this will is presented in the appendix. We may here note what is said in the second paragraph of this published will. However, in view of the fact that in donating the journal Zion's Watchtower, the old theology quarterly and the copyrights of the millennial down scripture, studies books and various other booklets, hymn books, etc., to the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. I did so with the explicit understanding that I should have full control of all the interest of these publications during my lifetime, and that after my decease they should be conducted according to my wishes. I now herewith set forth the said wishes. My will respecting the same, as follows. Although he donated the Watchtower magazine to the corporation, at its incorporation in 1884, he clearly considered it his magazine, to be published according to his will even after his death. He directed that, upon his death, an editorial committee of five men, personally selected and named by him, should have entire editorial charge of the Watchtower magazine. The footnote reads, Russell did not list Rutherford among these five but placed him in a second group of five who might serve as replacements if occasion required. End of footnote. He also willed all his corporation voting shares to five women named by him as trustees, and provided that if any member of the editorial committee should be impeached, these women would serve along with the other corporation trustees, evidently the directors, and the remaining editorial committee members in acting as a board of judgment to decide the case of the editorial committee member accused. The book Jehovah's Witnesses in the Divine Purpose, published in 1959, page 64, says that by law Russell's votes died with him. Since one person cannot form a collective body, the facts show that during C.T. Russell's lifetime, that is up until 1916, 
there was not even a semblance of a governing body. That continued to be the case during the presidency of his successor, Joseph F. Rutherford. One might assume that the members of the editorial committee, along with the board of directors, would compose such a governing body. But the facts show that that assumption would be wrong. At the annual corporation meeting in January, 1917, Rutherford was elected to replace Russell as president of the Watchtower Corporation. Early in his presidency, four of the seven directors, a majority, took issue with what they viewed as arbitrary action on the part of the president. He was not recognizing the board of directors and working with it as a body but was acting unilaterally, taking actions and informing them later of what he had decided to do. They did not feel that this was at all in harmony with what Pastor Russell, the faithful and wise servant, had outlined as the course to follow. Their expressing objection led to their swift elimination. Typical of this course was Rutherford's decision to publish a book titled The Finished Mystery, presented as the posthumous work of Russell, but actually written by Clayton J. Woodworth and George H. Fisher. Rutherford not only had not consulted with the directors about the writing of the book, they did not even know it was being published until Rutherford released it to the Bethel family, the headquarters staff. Later Watchtower publications, including the book Jehovah's Witnesses in the Divine Purpose, pages 70, 71, give the impression that this was the initiating and primary cause of the objections of the four directors. This distorts the facts, since Rutherford announced the dismissal of these four men as directors the same day, July 17, 1917, that he presented the book The Finished Mystery to the headquarters staff. The announcement of the dismissal of the directors was, in fact, made before the book was presented. Rutherford found that, though they were personal appointees of C.T. Russell as directors for life, the directorship of these four had never been confirmed at an annual corporation meeting. According to A.H. McMillan, then a prominent member of the headquarters staff, Rutherford conferred with an outside lawyer who agreed that this allowed for dismissing the men. On a legal basis, that is. The footnote reads, A.H. McMillan, Faith on the March, Englewood Clips, Prentice Hall, Include, 1957, page 80. The foreword to the book is by N. H. Knorr. End of footnote. Rutherford thus had an option. He could acknowledge the objections of the majority of the board and seek to make amends. If he had viewed these men as the majority of a governing body of the kind described in the 1971 Watchtower he would have been morally bound to do so or, he could avail himself of the legal point mentioned and use his presidential authority to dismiss the directors who disagreed with him. He chose the latter course, appointing directors of his own choice to replace them. What of the editorial committee? The Watchtower of June 15, 1938, page 185, shows that in 1925 the majority of this committee strenuously opposed the publication of an article titled The Birth of the Nation, meaning the kingdom had begun to function in 1914. The Watchtower states the result to those who disagreed with the president. But, by the Lord's grace, it the article was published, and that really marked the beginning of the end of the editorial committee, indicating that the Lord himself is running his organization. The editorial committee was now eliminated. Rutherford had effectively excised any opposition to his full control of the organization. An interesting feature about all this is that during this entire time, not only the finished mystery book, a major bone of contention in 1917, but also the Watchtower magazine had been forcefully teaching that Pastor Russell was indeed the faithful and wise servant, foretold in scripture, whom the master would make ruler over his household. The footnote reads, see the finished mystery, pages 4, 11, The Watchtower, March 1, 1922, pages 72, 73, May 1, 1922, page 131, March 1, 1923, pages 67, 68. End of footnote.
The way in which this teaching was used to insist upon everyone's full conformity is well illustrated in these statements from the Watchtower of May 1, 1922, page 132. Faithfulness in loyalty to be faithful means to be loyal. To be loyal to the Lord means to be obedient to the Lord. To abandon or repudiate the Lord's chosen instrument means to abandon or repudiate the Lord himself upon the principle that he who rejects the servant sent by the master thereby rejects the master. There is no one in present truth today who can honestly say that he received a knowledge of the divine plan from any source other than by the ministry of Brother Russell, either directly or indirectly. Through his prophet Ezekiel Jehovah foreshadowed the office of a servant, designating him as one clothed with linen, with a writer's inkhorn by his side, who was delegated to go throughout the city, Christendom, and comfort that by enlightening their minds relative to God great plan. Be it noted that this was a favor bestowed not by man, but by the Lord himself. But in keeping with the Lord's arrangement he used a man. The man who filled that office, by the Lord's grace, was Brother Russell. Again, in the March 1, 1923, Watchtower, pages 68 and 71, in an article titled Loyalty the Test, Conformity to Russell's teachings and methods was equated with conformity to the Lord's will. We believe that all who are now rejoicing in present truth will concede that Brother Russell faithfully filled the office of special servant of the Lord, and that he was made ruler over all the Lord's goods. Every fellow servant has shown his ability or capacity and has increased the same in proportion as he has joyfully submitted to the Lord's will by working in the harvest field of the Lord in one or noni Lord s. Way which way the Lord used Brother Russell to point out, because Brother Russell occupied the office of that faithful and wise servant. He did the Lord's work according to the Lord's way. If, then, Brother Russell did the work in the Lord's way, any other way of doing it is contrary to the Lord's way and therefore could not be a faithful looking after the interest of the Lord's kingdom. The issue was quite clear. Either one could loyally line up with and conform to the teachings and way of this ruler over the master's household, Russell, or he could become guilty of repudiation of Christ Jesus, hence, an apostate. Rarely has appeal to human authority been more strongly stated. That is what makes it so notable that, within a few years of Russell's death, and during the very time these claims about him were made, the provisions he made in life and his personal selections of men for the office of supervision were set aside by the new president. Russell's expressions contained in his will were discounted as having no legal force and, evidently, no moral force either. The Watchtower of December 15, 1931, page 376, says of it, The facts which are well known to exist and which apply to the prophetic words of Jesus are these in 1914. Jehovah placed his king upon his throne. The three and one half years immediately following afforded the opportunity to test those who had responded to the call to the kingdom, as to whether or not they were selfish or unselfish. In 1916 the president of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society died. A paper writing was found which he had signed and which was called his last will and testament, but which in fact was not a will. It then appeared that Brother Russell, some years before his death, had concluded that he could not make such a will. The work of God's organization is not subject to the control of man or to be controlled by the will of any creature, it was therefore not possible to carry on the work of the society to the Lord's glory and honor as outlined in that paper writing, called a will. Just eight years before, the Watchtower, the Lord's Channel, had insisted that Russell did the Lord's work according to the Lord's way and therefore any other way of doing it is contrary to the Lord's way. Now, eight years later, any who objected to Rutherford's setting aside of the directions given by the one the Watchtower had so adamantly argued was the faithful and wise servant were portrayed as motivated by ill will and malice, as workers of iniquity. This gathered out or rejected class, however, do weep and wail, and they gnash their teeth against their brethren, because, they say, Brother Russell's will is being ignored, and the watchtower is not being published as he directed, and they hold up their hands in holy horror and shed crocodile tears because the Lord's organization on earth is not being used according to the will of a man. In other words, 
they make these pretenses as a cause for weeping and wailing and sorrow. They wail, complain and weep because they have not charge of the society. They gnash their teeth against those who are engaged in the Lord's work, and they give expression to all manner of ill will, malice and lying statements against those whom they once claimed to be their brethren. Jude mentions the same class, and his words definitely fix the time when this wailing and weeping begins, to wit, at the time the Lord Jesus Christ comes to the temple of Jehovah for judgment. He says, these are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lust selfish desires, and their mouth speak great swelling words f claiming themselves to be God's favored ones, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage fin other words, they express their admiration for the person of man and desire admiration for themselves, and their conduct and course of action exactly fit the words of the apostle. They make great pretense of love and devotion to a man, namely brother Russell, but it is manifest they do so with a view of gaining some selfish advantage. The purpose, therefore, of mentioning these matters, and manifestly the purpose of the Lord in permitting his people to understand them, is that they might avoid such workers of iniquity. It is difficult to explain such fickle, unstable, erratic course. Yet this was supposedly the channel the Lord Jesus Christ had found so worthy of being made his sole means of direction to people on earth. In actuality, by 1925 J. F. Rutherford exercised unquestioned direction of the society and the years that followed only strengthened his control over all organization functions. The footnote reads, A. H. Macmillan in Faith on the March, page 152, says, Russell had left it much to the individual as to how we were to fulfill our responsibilities. Rutherford wanted to unify the preaching work and, instead of having each individual give his own opinion and tell what he thought was right and do what was in his own mind, gradually Rutherford himself began to be the main spokesman for the organization. That was the way he thought the message could best be given without contradiction. End of footnote. This included full control of what would be published through the channel of the Watchtower and other publications used to provide spiritual food for the congregations earthwide. I recall my uncles telling me one day in his office of an occasion when Rutherford presented a certain issue, a new viewpoint, to the Bethel family for discussion. The footnote reads, the point at issue was either the new view that the higher powers of Romans chapter 13, verse 1 were not the governmental authorities of earth but were Jehovah God and Jesus Christ, or the decision regarding the elimination of bodies of elders, which of the two I do not now recall. End of footnote. My uncle related that in the discussion he expressed himself negatively about the new view being advanced, doing so on the basis of scripture. Afterward, he said, President Rutherford personally assigned him to prepare material in support of this new view, although he, Fred France, had made clear that he did not consider it scriptural. On another occasion he related that the judge, Rutherford, later in his presidency made it a firm policy that the Watchtower magazine would carry only articles that stressed prophecy or the preaching work. For that reason a period of years passed in which articles on subjects such as love, kindness, mercy, long-suffering and similar qualities simply did not appear in the magazine. Thus, during the nearly 60-year period of the presidencies of Russell and Rutherford, each man acted according to his own prerogative in exercising his presidential authority, with no hint of a governing body. In 1993 the organization produced a new history book, titled Jehovah's Witnesses. Proclaimers of God's Kingdom, replacing a previous work titled Jehovah's Witnesses in the Divine Purpose. It seems evident that at various points the book seeks to counter the effect of information that has appeared in published form in recent years, including the original 1983 printing of this book, Crisis of Conscience, the 1991 printing of its sequel, In Search of Christian Freedom, and in Carl Olive Johnson's book The Gentile Times Reconsidered, which first appeared in 1983. Certain facts are admitted for the first time in this new history book, perhaps with a view to muting the effect if members were to become aware of them through other sources. At its start the books 
Editors assure readers of their endeavor to be objective and to provide a candid history. The footnote reads, see the foreword to the book Jehovah's Witnesses. Proclaimers of God's Kingdom. As but one illustration of presenting information already made available by another source, this book, on page 200, presents a picture of the Brooklyn headquarters. Staff celebrating Christmas in 1926. That photo was published in 1991 in the book in Search of Christian Freedom, page 149. Two years later the new history book presented it for the first time in a Watchtower publication. Yet that photo had been in their possession for 67 years. End of footnote. The vast majority of Jehovah's Witnesses have no access to the records of the past and no personal knowledge of the events relating to the organization's development. The operations of the central authority structure or of the men forming that inner authority structure are likewise unknown to them. They are thus essentially at the mercy of the editors of this 1993 publication supposedly impartial, candid history. I have seldom read a more sanitized less objective presentation. Its depiction of organizational history and policy paints a picture that differs measurably from reality. This is the case in its discussion of the presidencies of both Russell and Rutherford. With regard to the identification of the faithful and wise servant of Matthew chapter 24, verse 45 to 47, this book finally acknowledges, on pages 142, 143, 626, that, for a number of years the Watchtower magazine did indeed set forth the view that Charles Taz Russell was that chosen faithful and wise servant, and that, from 1896 on, Russell himself acknowledged the apparent reasonableness of this view. It does not acknowledge the fact that Russell not only viewed as reasonable the application to an individual, himself, as the specially chosen faithful and wise servant but that, in the very watchtowers the book lists in its footnote, he actually argued for it as the true scriptural application, rather than the position he had taken back in 1881. Rather than acknowledge this, the new history book misleadingly continues to place emphasis on Russell's 1881 statement in which he applied the figure to the entire body of Christ. The book does not inform its readers that in the October 1, 1909 issue of the Watchtower Russell described as his opponents those who would apply the term faithful and wise servant to all the members of the Church of Christ rather than to an individual. Nor does it tell its readers that the special issue of the Watchtower of October 16, 1916 stated that, while not openly claiming the title, Russell admitted as much in private conversation. And while acknowledging finally that for years after his death the Watchtower magazine itself promoted the view of Russell as that servant. The book gives the reader no idea of the insistence with which this was done, as in stating that everyone having a knowledge of God's divine plan must truthfully admit that he derived that knowledge from studying the Bible in connection with what Brother Russell wrote, that before such time he did not even know that God had a plan of salvation, or in describing those questioning any of Russell's teaching as having rejected the Lord because of rejecting his special servant. The footnote reads, See pages 219 to 202 of Crisis of Conscience, also pages 78 to 84 of the book, In Search of Christian Freedom. End of footnote. Likewise it does not explain the paradox created by the Watchtower's own teaching, on the one hand, the present-day teaching, that in 1919 Christ Jesus definitely selected, approved and identified a faithful and wise servant class, and, on the other hand, the fact that in that very same year of 1919 and for years thereafter the very one supposedly so chosen believed the faithful and wise servant was not a class but an individual, Charles Taz Russell, selected many decades before 1914 by a reigning Christ who had become present since 1874. Effort is made, on pages 220, 221 of the Watchtower's new history book, to deny that the second president, Joseph F. Rutherford, 
sought to gain full and total control of the organization. A quotation from Carl Klein is presented to show him as actually and essentially humble man, childlike in prayer to God. Yet the historical record demonstrates that anyone, including any member of the board of directors or of those on the editorial committee, who expressed disagreement with Rutherford was quickly eliminated from whatever organizational position that person occupied. One has only to talk with others who were at the headquarters during his presidency to know that the picture of humility conveyed by Carl Klein does not conform to the reality, and that, to all intents and purposes, the judge's word was law. I was actively associated with the organization during the last five years of his presidency and know the clear effect the man had upon me and the viewpoint that others expressed. Most witnesses today have not had that experience. But God's Son said that out of the heart, the mouth speaks, and that by your words you will be justified or judged. Matthew chapter 12, verse 34, 37, I believe that anyone who simply reads the material found in the Watchtower magazine from the 1920s on through to 1942 can clearly see the spirit not of humility, but of dogmatism and authoritarianism the articles breathed, articles admittedly written principally by Rutherford. Deprecating, even harsh language is employed against any who dared to question any position, policy or teaching that came forth from the organization of which he was the head. On these same pages of the book Jehovah's Witnesses, Proclaimers of God's Kingdom, effort is made to demonstrate that Rutherford was not looked upon by the membership as their leader and his personal denial of such position, made in 1941 just before his death, is quoted as proof. The caption beneath the photo shown on the next page was placed there by the writer or writers of the Watchtower's history book. The words are there but the facts are not. While admittedly Watchtower adherents viewed Christ as their invisible leader, the fact is that they did look upon Rutherford as their visible earthly leader, contrary to Christ's injunction at Matthew chapter 23, verse 10, neither be called leaders, for your leader is one, the Christ. Rutherford cannot fail to have known that the membership viewed him in that light. Consider the following photos and captions from the Messenger, a Watchtower Convention report, of July 25, 1931 describing large conventions held that year in major European cities. The captions shown underneath are the original captions found in the Messenger. Compare them with the caption the writer or writers of the Society's History book placed beneath that book's photo of J. F. Rutherford, shown here to the right, claiming that the witnesses knew that he was not their leader. The first photo in the Messenger, of a 1931 convention in Paris, in its caption underneath describes Rutherford explicitly as their visible leader. In the next two, from London and from Magdeburg, Germany, the captions refer to Rutherford as the chief. A fourth designates him Generalissimo of the convention. This convention report was printed ten years before Rutherford's 1941 statement quoted in the Watchtower's new history book. There is no reason to believe that Rutherford was not aware of the way he was actually viewed by Watchtower adherents throughout most of his presidency and he clearly did nothing to change that image. The evidence, including the whole history of his administration, makes his disavowal of that image. Made when nearing death. Seem hollow. When Judge Rutherford died on January 8, 1942, Nathan H. Knorr was unanimously elected president by the board of directors. The organizational structure continued basically the same, though with some adjustments, as Knorr did field out some responsibility. Circumstances actually made this a necessity, for the number of witnesses grew from only 108,000 at the time of Rutherford's death to more than 2 million during Knorr's presidency. Not a writer nor particularly a student of scripture, Knorr relied on Fred France, the vice president, as more or less the final arbiter on scriptural matters and the principal writer of the organization. Questions such as those discussed at governing body sessions, related earlier in this chapter, were, for decades, 
submitted to Fred France for decision. If President Noor felt that the decision might have some critical effect on the society's operation in certain countries of the world, he would usually discuss it personally with Fred France and would not hesitate to make known what he felt the circumstances made advisable in a pragmatic way, overruling the vice president if necessary. As has been noted earlier, this basic relationship continued up into the 1970s as illustrated in the decision to return to having bodies of elders in the congregations. That particular decision hinged largely upon the view and opinion of one person, the vice president, and when he changed his mind and favored the return to bodies of elders, the president acceded. The same was basically the case with all published material. The president selected the main articles for the watchtower from material submitted by various writers and he then passed these on to the writing department for proofreading and any necessary editing or polishing. Then these were finally read by the vice president and the president and, if approved, were published. Carl Adams, who was in charge of the writing department when I entered it in 1965, explained to me that the president by then had given the department considerable latitude as to the reworking of such material. He pointed out the one exception, namely, any material written by the vice president, stating that what comes from Brother France is viewed as ready for publication, with no adjustments to be made. Here again, nonetheless, the president himself could overrule. As an example, in 1967, President Noor sent to Carl Adams, Ed Dunlap and myself, copies of A Questions from readers that Fred France had prepared and turned in for publication. The footnote reads, of the three receiving copies, at the time I was the only one professing to be of the anointed class, having made such profession since 1946. End of footnote. Just the year before, a book had been published, authored by Fred France, in which it was pointed out that the year 1975 would mark the end of 6,000 years of human history. Likening those 6,000 years to six days of a thousand years each, he had written. So in not many years within our own generation we are reaching what Jehovah God could view as the seventh day of man's existence. How appropriate it would be for Jehovah God to make of this coming seventh period of a thousand years a Sabbath period of rest and release, a great jubilee Sabbath for the proclaiming of liberty throughout the earth to all its inhabitants. This would be most timely for mankind. It would also be most fitting on God's part, for, remember, mankind has yet ahead of it what the last book of the Holy Bible speaks of as the reign of Jesus Christ over earth for a thousand years, the millennial reign of Christ. Prophetically Jesus Christ, when on earth nineteen centuries ago, said concerning himself, for Lord of the Sabbath is what the Son of Man is. Matthew chapter 12, verse 8, It would not be by mere chance or accident but would be according to the loving purpose of Jehovah God for the reign of Jesus Christ, the Lord of the Sabbath, to run parallel with the seventh millennium of man's existence. The footnote reads, Life Everlasting in Freedom of the Sons of God, published in 1966, pages 29, 30. End of footnote. Not for many decades had there been such a sense of excitement among Jehovah's Witnesses as these statements generated. A tremendous surge of expectation developed, far surpassing the feeling of the end's nearness that I and others had experienced in the early 1940s. That is why we were amazed to see that the question from readers Fred France had worked up now argued that the end of 6,000 years would actually come one year earlier than had just been published in the new book namely that it would come in 1974 instead of 1975. As Noor told Carl Adams, when he received this material he went to Fred France and asked why the sudden change. France replied with definiteness, this is the way it is. It's 1974. Noor did not feel at ease with the change and that is why he sent the three of us copies with his request that we submit our individual observations. The vice president's argumentation was built almost entirely upon the use of a cardinal and an ordinal number in the account of the flood at Genesis, chapter 7, verses 6 and 11, 600 years and the 600th year. The argument endeavored to show that the count of time set out in the new book was off one year as to the time of the flood and that one more year needed to be added, 
with the result that the end of 6,000 years would come up one year earlier, in 1974 instead of 1975. Each of the three of us respectfully wrote that we did not think the material should be published, that it would have an extremely unsettling effect on the brothers. The footnote reads, in the letter I submitted, I pointed out that the argument rested heavily on a portion of scripture that is difficult to be definite about, and that the reasons given for the change were, at best, tenuous. End of footnote. The president evidently agreed, since the material prepared by the vice president was never published and this was quite a rare occurrence. It was during Noor's presidency that the term governing body first began to be used with a measure of frequency. The footnote reads, in the Watchtower of June 1, 1938, pages 168, in an article on organization the expression central body and central authority are used but only with reference to the body of apostles and those who were their immediate associates, with no modern application made. The term governing body first appears in its current usage in the Watchtower, October 15, 1944, page 315, and November 1, 1944, pages 328-333. End of footnote. The literature now began to tie such a body in with the board of directors of the Watchtower Society. In the Society's book, Qualified to be Ministers, published in 1955, page 381, the statement appears, During the years since the Lord came to his temple the visible governing body has been closely identified with the board of directors of this corporation. Thus the seven members of the board of directors were considered to be the seven members of the governing body. The fact is, however, that their situation was much as had been the case with the directors in Russell's and Rutherford's day. Marley Cole, a witness who wrote a book, with the full cooperation of the society, entitled Jehovah's Witnesses. The New World Society, points this out. The footnote reads, Marley Cole, Jehovah's Witnesses. The New World Society, New York, Vantage Press, 1955. Pages 86 to 89. Cole wrote the book as if he were a non-witness writing an objective account. The idea was that by having the book published by an outside publishing firm it might reach persons who normally would not take society literature. Thus it was a form of public relations tactic. End of footnote. In a section headed Internal Rebellion, he first describes the controversy in 1917 between Rutherford and the board, saying, four directors wanted a reorganization. As things stood the president was the administration. He was not consulting them. He was letting them know what he was doing only after it was done. He was putting them in the position of advisors on legal corporate matters. Rutherford made no bones about going ahead. The pastor before him had worked that way. The pastor made decisions. The pastor issued administrative orders without the board's prior sanction. Then, in a footnote, Cole states, that the president of the society thereafter continued to exercise such unrestricted freedom may be seen by the following account of N. H. Noor's actions in relation to bringing forth a new Bible translation. The footnote reads, Ibid page 88. End of footnote. The Watchtower of September 15, 1950, pages 315 and 316, is then quoted. It reveals that the directors of the board were first informed by the president of the existence of the New World Translation, probably one of the biggest projects ever engaged in by the organization, only after the translation of the Greek scripture portion had already been completed and was ready for printing. Right up until 1971 when the tail wagging the dog talk was given, the board of directors did not meet on any regular schedule but only as the president decided to convene them. Sometimes months went by without any meetings, the most frequent agenda evidently being such corporate matters as the purchase of property or of new equipment. As a rule, they had nothing to say about what scriptural material would be published, nor was their approval sought. Vice President Franz made this clear when testifying before a court in Scotland in 1954 in a case known as the Walsh case. 
questioned as to what was done if some major change in doctrine was made and whether such had to be first approved by the board of directors, the vice president replied, the material here being reprinted from the official court transcript with Q representing the question of the counselor and A the response given by Fred France, question. In matters spiritual has each member of the board of directors an equally valid voice? Answer. The president is the mouthpiece. He pronounces the speeches that show advancement of the understanding of the scriptures. Then he may appoint other members of the headquarters temporarily to give other speeches that set forth any part of the Bible upon which further light has been thrown. Question. Tell me, are these advances, as you put it, voted upon by the directors? Answer. No. Question. How do they become? Pronouncements. Answer. They go through the editorial committee. And I give my OK after scriptural examination. Then I pass them on to President Noor, and President Noor has the final OK. Question. Does it not go before the board of directors at all? Answer. No. The footnote reads, Although the vice president makes reference to an editorial committee he later identifies only himself and President Noor as on that committee from among the board members. In actuality there was no official editorial committee aside from these two. In 1965 Carl Adams was the only other one whose signature was regularly required on material to be published and he was not on the board of directors nor does he profess to be of the anointed class. End of footnote. I personally knew that presentation of matters to be true as regards the board of directors. Before 1971, I was in a meeting with several writing staff members called by Carl Adams, and the question arose as to how to get the president's approval of certain proposed improvements in the Watchtower magazine. Someone suggested that Lyman Swingle, who was present as one of the writers, broach the matter to Knorr. Swingle's reply was brief but spoke volumes as to the reality of the situation. He said, why me? What can I do? I'm only a director. Not only do the statements by the vice president at the Scotland trial bear on the issue of the existence of a genuine governing body at that time, they also show how fictitious the claim is that the spiritual food provided proceeds from a faithful and discreet slave class. Two, or at best, three men determined what information would appear in the Watchtower magazine and other publications. Nathan Knorr, Fred France and Carl Adams, the last of these not of the so-called anointed class. As the vice president's statements clearly show, not even the members of the board of directors, all supposedly members of the faithful and discreet slave class, were invited to express approval of the spiritual food to be presented. Thus, even as Russell up until the year 1916 exercised full and unique control over what was published by the Watchtower Society, and just as Rutherford did so throughout his presidency until 1942, similarly during Knorr's presidency the exercise of authority as to the preparation and serving up of the spiritual food for the witness community was limited to two or three men, not something carried out by a class of persons, supposedly assigned by Christ to be over all his belongings. The footnote reads, Matthew chapter 24, verse 47. End of footnote. The situation remained the same even after the enlargement of the governing body to include more than the seven directors. In 1975 during one session some material the vice president had prepared for use as a convention talk came up for discussion. It dealt with the parable of the mustard seed and the parable of the leaven, found in Matthew chapter 13 and argued in detail that the kingdom of the heavens Jesus referred to in these parables was actually a fake kingdom, a counterfeit. One member of the body who had read the material felt unconvinced by the argumentation. After discussion, of the 14 members present only five, including Noor and Fred France, voted in favor of using the material as a convention talk, the other nine did not. So it was not used. As a talk, but the material appeared in a book released at the convention and within a few months also appeared in the Watchtower magazine. The footnote reads, See the book Man's Salvation Out of World Distress at Hand. Published in 1975, 
pages 206 to 215, also The Watchtower, October 1, 1975, pages 589 to 608. End of footnote. The fact that nearly two-thirds of the body members present had expressed at least some lack of confidence in the material did not affect the president's decision to go ahead with publishing it. Not only the contents of the magazines and other literature, but every other feature of the worldwide activity of Jehovah's Witnesses. The direction of the 90 or more branch offices, each overseer of a branch being described as the presiding minister of Christianity. For and within the territory to which he has been appointed, the supervision of all the work of all traveling representatives, the direction of the missionary school of Gilead and the assignment and work of all missionaries, the planning of conventions and convention programs. All this and much more ultimately were the sole prerogative of one person, the president of the corporation. Whatever the governing body discussed or did not discuss in any of these areas was strictly as the result of his decision and at his discretion. All this was difficult to reconcile with the articles published after the vice president's tail wagging the dog talk. The language there had been so forceful, so conclusive. Thus, too, even though there were no apostles of Christ on hand in the 19th century, God's Holy Spirit must have been operative toward the formation of the governing body for his anointed remnant of the faithful and discreet slave class. The facts speak for themselves. There came on the scene a body of anointed Christians who accepted and undertook the responsibilities of governing the affairs of Jehovah's dedicated, baptized, anointed people who were following in the footsteps of Jesus Christ and endeavoring to fulfill the work stated in Jesus' prophecy at Matthew chapter 24, verses 45 to 47. Facts speak louder than words. The governing body is there. Thankfully Jehovah's Christian witnesses know and assert that this is no one-man religious organization, but that it has a governing body of spirit-anointed Christians. The footnote reads, The Watchtower, December 15, 1971, page 761. End of footnote. Unfortunately the picture presented simply was not true. The facts do speak for themselves, and the facts, already presented from the Watchtower Society's own approved publications and from statements of directors, clearly show there was no governing body in any factual sense in the 19th century during Russell's presidency, none in the 20th century during Rutherford's presidency, and there had been none in the sense described in this same Watchtower article during Noor's presidency. It was an impressive sounding picture presented but it was illusory, fictional. The fact is that a monarchical arrangement prevailed from the very inception of the organization, the word monarch being of Greek origin and meaning one who governs alone, also defined in dictionaries as one holding preeminent position and power. That the first president was benign, the next stern and autocratic, and the third very businesslike, in no way alters the fact that each of the three presidents exercised monarchical authority. The great majority of witnesses forming what the 1971 Watchtower article had referred to as the rank and file. And including most of the anointed composing the faithful and discreet slave class. Were totally unaware of this. Those in positions close enough to the seat of authority knew it to be the case, the closer they were the more they were aware of the facts. This was particularly true of the members of the governing body and in 1975 the dog decided it was time to wag the tail. Most of the members felt that it was time that the facts finally started matching the words being spoken and published. Interestingly, what was done was essentially the same as what the four directors in 1917 had proposed, a reorganization, an effort on their part that had consistently been described thereafter in the Watchtower publications as an ambitious plot and a rebellious conspiracy, one that, by God's grace, did not succeed. Fifty-five years later basically the same proposition did succeed, but only after months of turmoil for the governing body. End of chapter 3, followed by the appendix on page 409. Will and Testament of Charles Taz Russell Having at various times during past years donated to the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society all of my personal possessions except a small personal bank account of approximately $200, in the Exchange National Bank of Pittsburgh, 
which will properly be paid over to my wife if she survives me, I have merely love and Christian good wishes to leave to all of the dear members of the Bible House family, and all other dear cola borers in the harvest work, yes, for all of the household of faith in every place who call upon the name of the Lord Jesus as their Redeemer. However, in view of the fact that in donating the journal, Zion's Watchtower, the Old Theology Quarterly and the copyrights of the Millennial Dawn Scripture Studies books and various other booklets, hymn books, etc., to the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, I did so with the explicit understanding that I should have full control of all the interests of these publications during my lifetime, and that after my decease they should be conducted according to my wishes. I now herewith set forth the said wishes, my will respecting the same as follows. An Editorial Committee of Five I direct that the entire editorial charge of Zion's Watchtower shall be in the hands of a committee of five brethren, whom I exhort to great carefulness and fidelity to the truth. All articles appearing in the columns of Zion's Watchtower shall have the unqualified approval of at least three of the committee of five, and I urge that if any matter approved by three be known or supposed to be contrary to the views of one or both of the other members of the committee, such articles shall be held over for thought, prayer and discussion for three months before being published. That so far possible the unity of the faith and the bonds of peace may be maintained in the editorial management of the journal. As the society is already pledged to me that it will publish no other periodicals, it shall also be required that the editorial committee shall write for or be connected with no other publications in any manner or degree. My object in these requirements is to safeguard the committee and the journal from any spirit of ambition or pride or headship, and that the truth may be recognized and appreciated for its own worth, and that the Lord may more particularly be recognized as the head of the church and the fountain of truth. Copies of my Sunday discourses published in the daily newspapers covering a period of several years have been preserved and may be used as editorial matter for the watchtower or not, as the committee may think best, but my name shall not be attached nor any indication whatever given respecting the authorship. Those named below as members of the editorial committee, subject to their acceptance, are supposed by me to be thoroughly loyal to the doctrines of the scriptures, especially so to the doctrine of the ransom, that there is no acceptance with God and no salvation to eternal life except through faith in Christ and obedience to his word and its spirit. If any of the designated ones shall at any time find themselves out of harmony with this provision, they will be violating their consciences and hence committing sin, if they continue to remain members of this editorial committee, knowing that so to do would be contrary to the spirit and intention of this provision. The editorial committee is self-perpetuating, in that should one of these members die or resign, it will be the duty of the remainder to elect his successor, that the journal may never have an issue without a full editorial committee in respect to the election of others to their number, that the purity of life, clearness in the truth, zeal for God, love, for the brethren and faithfulness to the Redeemer shall be prominent. Characteristics of the one elected In addition to the five named for the committee, before going outside for a general selection, unless in the interim, between the making of this will, and the time of my death, something should occur which would seem to indicate these as less desirable or others as more desirable for filling the vacancies mentioned. The names of the editorial committee are as follows. William E. Page William E. Van Amberg Henry Clay Rockwell E. W. Bren Eisen F. H. Robeson the names of the five whom I suggest as possibly amongst the most suitable from which to fill vacancies in the editorial Hoskins, G. O. H. Fisher, Scranton, J. F. Rutherford, Dr. John Edgar. Zion's Watchtower Editorial Committee. This journal is published under the supervision of an editorial committee, at least three of whom must have read and have approved as truth each and every article appearing in these columns. The names of the committee now serving are, names to follow. As for compensation, I think it wise to maintain the society's course of the past in respect to salaries, that none be paid, that merely reasonable expenses be allowed to those who serve the society or its work in any manner. 
in harmony with the course of the society, I suggest that the provision for the editorial committee, or the three that shall be actively engaged, shall consist of not more than a provision for their food and shelter and ten dollars per month, with such a moderate allowance for wife or children or others dependent upon them for support as the society's board of directors shall consider proper, just, reasonable, that no provision be made for the laying up of money. I desire that the old theology quarterly continue to appear as at present, so far as the opportunities for distribution and the laws of the land will permit, and that its issues shall consist of reprints from the old issues of the Watchtower or extracts from my discourses, but that no name shall appear in connection with the matter unless the same is required by law. It is my with that the same rules apply to the German, the French, the Italian, the Danish and the Swedish or any other foreign publications controlled or supported by the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. I will, that a copy of this paper be sent to each one whose name has appeared above as of the editorial committee or the list from whom others of that committee may be chosen to fill vacancies and also to each member of the board of directors of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. This shall be done immediately on my dearth being reported, so that within a week, if possible, the persons named as of the editorial committee may be heard from their communications being addressed to the Vice President of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. Whoever may be holding that office at that time. The answers of those appointed shall be to the point, indicating their acceptance or rejection of the provisions and terms specified. A reasonable time shall be allowed for anyone mentioned who may be absent from the city or fro the country. Meantime remainder of the committee of at least three shall proceed to act in their capacity as editors. It shall be the duty of the officers of the society to provide the necessary arrangements for these members of the editorial committee and to assist them in their duties in every possible manner, in compliance with the engagements made with me. Bearing on this matter, I have already donated to the Watchtower Bible and Track Society all my voting shares therein, putting the same in the hands of five trustees, as follows. Sister E. Louise Hamilton Sister Almeta M. Nation Robeson Sister J. G. Hare Sister C. Tomlins Sister Alice G. James The trustees shall serve for life. In event of deaths or resignations, successors shall be chosen by the Watchtower Society Directors and Editorial Committee and the remaining trustees after prayer for divine guidance. I now provide for the impeachment and dismissal from the editorial committee of any member thereof found to be unworthy the position, by reason of either doctrinal or moral latches, as follows. At least three of the board must unite in bringing the impeachment charges and the board of judgment in the matter shall consist of the Watchtower Bible and Track Society's trustees and the five trustees, controlling my voting shares and the editorial committee excepting the accused of these 16 members at least 13 must favor the impeachment and dismissal in order to effect the same directions for funeral i desire to be buried in the plot of ground owned by our society in the rosemont united cemetery and all the details of arrangements respecting the funeral service i leave in the care of my sister mrs m m land and her daughters Alice and May, or such of them as may survive me, with the assistance and advice and cooperation of the brethren, as they may request the same. Instead of an ordinary funeral discourse, I request that they arrange to have a number of the brethren, accustomed to public speaking, make a few remarks each. That the service be very simple and inexpensive and that it be conducted in the Bible House Chapel or any other place that may be considered equally appropriate or more so. My legacy of love to the dear Bethel family collectively and individually, I leave my best wishes, in hoping for them of the Lord his blessing, which make the rich and added no sorrow. The same I extend in a still broader sweep to all the family of the Lord in every place, especially to those rejoicing in the harvest truth. I entreat you all that you continue to progress and to grow in grace, in knowledge, and above all in love the great fruit of the Spirit in its various diversified forms. I exhort to meekness, 
not only with the world, but with one another, to patience with one another and with all men, to gentleness with all, to brotherly kindness, to godliness, to purity. I remind you that all these things are necessary for us, necessary that we may attain the promised kingdom, and that the Apostle has assured us that if we do these things we shall never fail, but that so an entrance shall be ministered unto us abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. It is my wish that this my last will and testament be published in the issue of the watchtower following my death. My hope for myself, as for all the dear Israel of God, is that soon we shall meet to part no more, in the first resurrection, in the Master's presence, where there is fullness of joy forevermore. We shall be satisfied when we awake in his likeness, changed from glory unto glory. Signed, Charles Taz Russell. Published and declared in the presence of the witnesses whose names are attached, May F. Land. M. Almeta Nation. Laura M. Whitehouse. Done at Allegheny, Pennsylvania, June 29, 19. 107. The preceding document is the will prepared by Charles Taz Russell, founder of the Watchtower Society and its magazine, as published in the Watchtower of December 1, 1916. End of Appendix for Chapter 3